we are vulnerable and we are our, our authentic selves and we are truthful, then that facade falls away from us and from our audience and allows us to create that genuine, again, a genuine human emotional connection. It's huge. Welcome to Real Creative Leadership, a video podcast produced by The Stoke Group and hosted by me, Adam Morgan. Today, we are going to talk about something that's been a part of my creative path for decades, I would say, and that's the idea of the art of the pitch, pitching ideas, pitching campaigns, pitching anything that you need to. And every creative knows the importance of the pitch, but what goes into the pitch is only half of it. So today, we're going to talk about what, it, what you need to do to prepare yourself for these big moments and how creative leaders can guide their teams to become experts at exciting, compelling, and emotional pitches. And you know me, I love that last one, emotions drive business, nostalgia, fear, anger. All of these are powerful emotions that can yield real results when you're attempting to move audiences with your pitch. And I can't think of anyone more perfectly suited to help guide this conversation on the art of the pitch than Danny Fontaine. Danny is the creative director for the UK and Ireland for IBM. He's also the founder of the Experiential Selling Team, which focuses on powerful communication strategies for IBM's clients. And Danny hosts a topic-related Apple podcast, Pitch Masters, which I've, ha I've had the pleasure of being on. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our show today, Danny. Welcome to Real Creative Leadership. Oh, thank you very much. What a beautiful introduction. I, I, lovely to be here. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we've had a lot of... If we start to dig into something like it sounds like we've been talking about this for a while, everyone, it's because we've had several conversations <laughs> on this topic. So <clears throat> I'm just excited we can finally have like a real show here so you all can share in Danny's wisdom on, on this awesome topic. Yeah, we're just going to hit record this time. That's the only difference. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> all right. Well, I've gotten to know you, but our audience does not know you, Danny. So why don't you just at the first here, just give us a little bit of your background on creative leadership and pitching and all of that so that we can get to know you. Sure. I mean, I, I stumbled into where I am now. My background is in art. I did a degree in fine art, painting and photography. And then, like most people, I couldn't get a job for the life of me with a degree like that. And uh, ended up in, you know, long story short, did some teaching ended up in consultancies, didn't know what consultancies were until after I was hired and sort of figured that out, tried every job in the agency. And one day someone said, uh, would you like to try sales? And I thought, absolutely no way <laughs> am, I, <laughs> am I ever going to wear a shiny suit and sell my <laughs> soul and you know manipulate people into buying something they don't want. And over the years, I've realized that sales, believe it or not, I think it's one of the most creative parts of a business because there's, there's hardly any bureaucracy for a start. It's, a, it's the wild west. You can do whatever you want. There's hardly any brand guidelines for something that's only ever going to be seen once in a small, dark room <laughs> uh, and, and will never see the light of day again. Now... Of course, I'm not talking about the actual material that you're trying to sell to a client, the artwork and uh, mm -hmm. the service and the product, but what you build around that, the experience you build around it and, and you know, the limitless boundaries that you do around that is what gets me really, really excited. And I guess, as you can see, I, I, I get very excited talking about this. I can talk about <laughs> yeah. it for for, for hours, and we haven't got hours, so I'll try and keep my answers quite short. But that's where I am today. I'm at IBM, and in the UK, I help to win some of the biggest and most strategic deals by applying what I call experiential selling. So this is how do we engage with all five senses of our audience? How do we mm. persuade and compel using your favorite topic, emotion, and creating those emotional connections? Oh, absolutely. Boy, when you put it that way, it's true. We are all in sales. Like we just, the, the sooner we right. realize that and accept that, that if we have anything <laughs> to do with marketing or, I don't know, commercial creativity at brands and companies, experiences, everything that you've just talked about, like we're all in sales. So that's a good Yeah, we just hate the idea of it, actually. And, you know, what, one of my favorite, the definition of uh, a pitch, for example, it's not preparing a PowerPoint presentation for a one-hour session uh, to a group of men in suits. It's, it's using any means, speech or act, to persuade someone of an idea. That's it. It's, it's doing anything you like 
to convince someone of something. And that's all it is. Well, good. Well, I hope we can get into some stories of some of those moments of just sharing sure. what you've done and maybe what I've done over the years of just like those cool little experiential moments that could be fun. I mean, one of my favorite stories on my podcast was your story. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk. Tell me about your podcast. Let's let everyone know about Pitchmasters so that they know what that is. All right. So um, when I first started in sales, I had no idea what I was doing. And I started reading a lot of books and I read books on sales. And then I moved into books more on psychology and then emotions and neuroscience and how we can be creative and what does creativity mean and then body language and then philosophy and a pitch encompasses all of these topics and I read and I read and I read and I, I became so overwhelmed but eventually you read enough to, to form your own kind of opinions and I really started to think how can I try and give back some of the most uh, important points that I've learned over the years to others because that's all I wanted to do it's a I, I don't make money I don't advertise on the podcast I just want to help other people and talk about my favorite topic which is pitching mm. so I asked a bunch of people uh, if they wanted to come and talk to me about pitching and these were my favorite authors predominantly so um and favorite speakers, Simon Sinek is one yeah. that everyone will know, yourself, of course. Uh, Rory Sutherland, who does uh, amazing things in, in the UK. Um, Robin Dreek, a former FBI agent um, who talks about trust. Just incredibly interesting people talking about every different side and angle of what is pitching. And they all bring their own phenomenal stories. And I always ask them to give me your best pitching story <laughs> and your worst pitching story as well, which is normally my favorite part of the episodes. Oh, that's interesting. I can't remember even what story I told on your thing. So you told this story of you were pitching to some uh, headset. Oh, Plantronics. Plantronics. Yes. And... You said I needed to create an anomaly, and that was a, a beautiful way of putting it. Because when we pitch to people, they expect us to speak about an introduction and then an agenda, and then go through some slides on technology, mm -hmm. and then some creative, and then finish on Q and A. And it's so boring that no one even pays attention. And these poor clients, these poor audiences, have to sit through five or six of these in a row, and, and we we show up just to give them what they expect. But you showed up at Plantronics headsets and you'd pre-learned some parkour. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, <clears throat> and you got onto the boardroom table and you did a front flip <laughs> off the table in between two of the directors uh, is, is my memory of the story. Yes, yes. It, we were pitching a TV idea and in the idea it was supposed to be these hands-free hands -free headsets. And this was like... I don't even know when this was, 2006 or something like that. And so one of the ideas is like, what if we do a spot about parkour where you're jumping around, grabbing, flipping, right. you know, it's like a perfect example of hands-free. And so as part of it, when I'm reading this script, yeah, I jumped up on the table and did this barrel roll flip <laughs> and my legs kicked right between the two heads of two executives. And I was like, so terrified. I'm like, if I kick one of them in the face, this is over. Yeah. Like we're done. That would have been over. Yeah. yeah. But luckily... I made it through and, and it turned out great. It was fun. They, they remembered it, right? Of course. Yeah. But even telling the story, it's a story that I will probably remember forever. And someone listening to this podcast right now will probably remember that little story forever as well. It's, that's how we get people to remember things, by creating anomalies and immersing them. Well, the other thing that you said that just kind of, and I know we're going off that original question, but... Um, you know, you're talking about like the basic structure of a pitch where it's like problem, solution, results. Like mm -hmm. uh, so many, so many presentations are in that. And sometimes I just want to be like, can't I just show what's possible? Like mm -hmm. what's the future? What's like the whole thing about this big idea is like, let's, let's stop worrying about problem, solution, results. And let's just talk to them about here's what we can do. Like here's where the future is going. Here's what's possible. I think that's just so much more exciting when it comes to trying to tell a story in a pitch. Absolutely. And, and the problem is we're so bound by what we think are the unbreakable rules of the pitch process, which is, man, I had this great idea. I wanted to tell them about the future of their business, 
but they gave me an agenda mm. and that's not on it. So I'm just going to have to follow their terrible agenda instead. And clients don't know what they want to hear most of the time. And it's, it's hard to even convince my colleagues sometimes. You don't have to do what they ask you. You don't have to do it. They, you know, every now and then procurement might be annoyed <laughs> with you, but who cares? Because if you can create that emotional connection and that impact and that, you know, experience, that's how you're going to win work, whether or not you've broken a procurement rule or not. That is so true. So I'm going to bring up another story that I just remember of, of a pitch that we won. And it was for a new client back when I was in agency and the, the clients, like they were just super stiff. Their arms were folded. They were just like having mm -hmm. none of this. And then I opened up <clears throat> my, my uh, computer to load up the, the presentation. And instead I had left a video game icon on my toolbar at the bottom and they saw the video game icon. And one was like, he's not even hiding it. He's not even trying to hide his video game icon, <laughs> you know? And that's the funny thing is like, that's what, that was the trigger. And then we started right. talking about the video game. The next thing you know, there are clients and they've, and I hadn't played that game in a long time. And they like bought me an account, made me go back and play it with them and hang out with them virtually right. for a while. And I was like, that's what did it was just that, that silly video game icon. So you never know. You never know what it is. It's not the, the set routine of what, what's going to get you there. Absolutely. And there's a few things that that talks about as well. One is if we research our audience and we find out that they do like specific things, then bring them into a pitch because that, you know, is the perfect example of how you can then hook them. But the second thing is you were being yourself at that moment in time. You were being authentic. And often we turn up to a pitch feeling like we are actors playing a part. Mm. We have to remember our lines. We have to act in a certain way. We mustn't say this. We must say this. And we get through it as close to possible as time so that we can leave. And we high five because we got through the rehearsal without fluffing a line, regardless of what impact or, or what happened in the room other than that. And actually, sometimes if we are just vulnerable, which is really hard in business, if we are vulnerable and we are all our authentic selves and we are truthful, then that facade falls away from us and from our audience and allows us to create that genuine, again, a genuine human mm -hmm. emotional connection. It's huge. The craft is really important. Like mm -hmm. we can't just go out there and be like, all right, we're just going to be this rock star and have the perfect pitch. And yes, we want to be authentic right. and vulnerable and all those things. But I think starting at, at level one, like you have to get the, the craft down. So talk to me more about what does it take to understand that and go through your journey of really absorbing everything about the craft? Yeah, I mean, it works both ways. You can be absolutely perfect at the craft and not have the emotion and the vulnerability and the authenticity and it won't work and, and vice versa you can just be a huge bubbling ball of energy without really knowing how to structure things and actually it comes down to psychology and in understanding the human brain that's what i figured out um and, and i read all of these things but a lot of them cross over and a lot mm. of them start to repeat themselves and whilst it's overwhelming i think that um you can boil it down to a bit of a process and really, for me, the, the big thing with pitching more than anything else probably is, is storytelling. And it's this concept as well. There's a couple of concepts here. One uh, of my mantras is emotion first, information second. So if I can make a connection with you by telling you an emotional story, for example, getting some kind of emotional reaction from you, mm. you will like it or not, subconsciously have a connection with me as a human. And your subconscious will be saying, I think I want to work with this guy, mm. even though you haven't necessarily understood my product or my service or my creative yet. You will then want your conscious brain to agree with your subconscious brain. So you will say, please show me evidence <laughs> so I can choose you. Please show me evidence. 
Now, what a lot of people do is they don't do the emotional bit f first and they just say, here's all of my evidence. Mm -hmm. And they come in cold and the human brain says, well, I, don't, I didn't ask for any evidence and I feel like you're trying to convince me of something. I feel like you're trying to sell to me. And actually, the more you're trying to sell to me, the more I'm going to push back on you. It's called the backfire phenomenon. It's a real psychological thing. It's based on a number of unconscious, uh, subconscious biases that we have. So it's really important. Emotion first, information second. And then the other thing that's, um, you know, one of the, one of the quickest ways for anyone to understand how to tell a good story is that we have something in our brain, uh, called mirror neurons. Mm. And these neurons, uh, are, we've got billions of them and they literally, when we have an emotional experience, they remember that experience. So when we recall an emotional experience, we feel that emotion again. But mirror neurons also mean that when I recall an emotional experience, you listening will feel that emotion as well. And that's really powerful. It's why we cry when we watch movies, not because we're going through that, it, but it's also why we're, you know, someone walks in a room and they're laughing and full of joy and we say, wow, you just make me feel better just when you walk in the room. It's because we're all mirroring these emotions. So if you want to tell a good story, if you want your clients or your audience to be full of joy, then tell a joyful story. Show joy and they will not be able to stop themselves from feeling it. And when we tell stories, we want to think, okay, what are the emotions we can make our audience feel? Well, if I'm feeling them myself, then they will automatically feel them as well. Okay, so the first thing you start out with, emotions first. And you gave a good example of telling an emotional story so they feel the mirrors. Maybe just a couple more examples of how you get that emotion in there. Is it um, usually just your own personal stories that you start out and be like, when I was 12, blah, 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 it blah, can blah. Be. Like, yeah, is that where you're starting out? Or what? tell me more about... This I mean, we've all got beginning. stories, so <laughs> you've got to make it relevant to what you're trying to pitch to the client. So um, if I'm pitching you something highly technical and actually I can think of a, a, a story from my lifetime that is a good metaphor rather than telling that technical story, then that's a great idea. But the other thing we want to do is tell a story that makes our audience the hero. So if I'm telling you, um, if I'm trying to sell a, a service or a product to you, I'll be talking about the problems that you might be facing in the world. And then I'll be using contrast throughout. And this is, you know, uh, prevalent across the greatest speeches of all time, Barack Obama's inauguration speech, mm. you know, uh, Steve Jobs launching the iPhone 2007, um, Martin Luther King Jr., I Have a Dream, one of the most, the best examples of this. You talk about the current world and the challenges in it, and then you contrast that to a glorious vision of the future and what could be. But then you contrast again to, but hang on a minute, there will be obstacles in your path. And then you tell your audience, but don't worry, because I know how to overcome them. So you're constantly on this emotional roller coaster, and that stems from the work of uh, Kurt Vonnegut. You can look him up on YouTube, and Nancy Duarte as well. So both really good teachers of this kind of shape of stories. But yeah, stories come from everywhere. They come from within us and our experiences, but you can also write a story as long as you make sure that your audience is the hero of that story and never you, because no one wants to mm. hear a story uh, uh, about you. They want to hear a story about them. Well, crap. I told a story about me in the beginning of this podcast, so I totally yeah, failed on sucked. that one already. Okay. <laughs> well, tell me more about this thing, because before, when, you were, when we were talking on this topic, you said something of disturb on purpose, reassure after. Mm. So that's like the emotion first and then your, your knowledge later, but it's a different one. Like, what do you mean by disturb on purpose? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one because there's a fine line between um, creating emotional stories and manipulating. And actually, uh, fear, which I think you mentioned earlier, is one of the strongest emotions. Fear, anger, there are negative emotions. And we can use them in a pitch as well, as long as we're not doing it to be sensationalist, as long as we're doing it to really ensure that our audience understands the kind of impact of, or the weight of what's going on. But certainly in business, we can talk about the, the 
the things that, you know, I work in the technology sector, the IT sector, and the amount of clients who are happy to sit with a burning platform, just thinking, well, it works today, so it'll probably work tomorrow. And sometimes you have to really say, look, the day that your platform does stop working, your entire business will come to a halt. And this is how your customers will be affected, your finances will be affected, your stakeholders will be affected. It'll have a huge knock-on effect that will cost many, many more millions than just fixing the problem now. Then that's disturbing. And that's fine as long as you give the assurance afterwards. And that's why we've created this plan for you so that you will never have to face that situation. So it's kind of rectification after you've done the disturb. Mm. Well, that's interesting. <clears throat> I also, before I move on, I just want to make a note, like you commenting on all of those famous speeches, that was fun. I just remember at one point in my life, I'm like, I just went through this rabbit hole of like just listening to all these famous speeches. And I think that's right. such an important thing to do because you, you learn a lot before you get into the pitch. Like what are the best in the world? You know, sometimes it's like, oh, I need to get a mentor. Right. Or I need to get someone to teach me, but no, you don't like they're out there. Some of the best speeches in the whole world are out there. All you have to do is listen to them and you can extract lessons from them. So I thought that was a, that was a good tidbit. Absolutely. And you know what, we're coming back to a point that we made earlier, the best speeches in the world are not uh, necessarily given by the best, uh, most confident people, the people mm. who, you know, who you think can just get up and talk. Some of the best speeches are from quiet introverted people who forget their lines and they stumble and they get things wrong and they look like they're about to pass out. But that again, because the audience can relate to them more mm. than they can a Barack Obama, for example, who's just very confident and very good at, uh, at, at speaking. So yeah, watch absolutely just, and that's the thing these days, everything's on YouTube, look up, I don't know, whatever, 100 best speeches of all time and just pick and choose and, you know, you will be moved. And just make a note, when you are moved by something or someone, what what did they do? What did they say? What Was it a contrast or was it an expression or a pause or was it the, the story? What was it? And then try and recreate that with other people. That's, you know, it's a good way of doing it. A next good, interesting question is most people, when they're going to attack uh, pitching or even public speaking, like it's a very similar, similar act and they're terrified of it. How do we overcome that fear? So we're not shaking. I, I know some of the tricks that I've done, but I'd like to hear from you first. How do we get past that fear of, you know, being in front of other people and being on center stage? Yeah, I, yeah, this is something that I actually work with people a lot on. And, and again, it comes from kind of my own process, which I've uh, learned slash stolen from other people. So uh, Viv Groskop, she's a stand-up comedian and, and, and writer. And she, she was on my podcast and she wrote a book called How to Own the Room, mm. which is really, really powerful. And she takes lessons from um, lots of other people as well. But essentially, there's a few things. First of all, it's breathing that's probably the most important thing. When we forget to breathe, our heart rate goes faster and we, uh, we're, we can't speak and our mouth goes dry, all of these terrible things. And it's very easy when the adrenaline is pumping to forget that. So when you first stand on the stage or in front of the client, pause, don't start talking right away. It's actually quite dramatic to just take some breaths and look at the audience and make sure that you are breathing slowly because there's a physiological connection as well that when we slow our breathing, our heart rate must slow down. Mm. It's not like it can help it, it must slow down. Our heart can't beat quickly if we don't breathe quickly. So if you're feeling shaky and nervous and your heart's racing, breathe really slowly. And there's something called box breathing where you Breathe in for six seconds, you hold it for six seconds, you breathe out for six seconds, and then you wait at that point for six seconds. So you're creating a six second box, mm. which is something I learned from actually one of my military guests. It's what, it's what uh, the, the Marines do 
while they're waiting uh, to go into a very terrifying situation. They do this thing called box breathing, so that's really interesting. Um, but the other thing you could do is you could do some visualizations. So uh, one of the things Viv Groskop taught me is that if you close your eyes and you breathe, taking a big deep breath through your nose, but imagine that the air is coming in from the ground in through the soles of your feet and then imagine it going all the way up your body and into your brain. And then when you breathe out, push it all the way down there, visualizing all the way back into the ground as well. Now, I don't know the science behind this, I'm not going to lie, but it really works. And then you can do one thing that goes even further, and that is you close your eyes and you imagine that your brain is in your stomach. You've got to just imagine mm. it. And now you're going to breathe in and the air is going to come through your feet, up your legs, past your knees, up your thighs, through your hips, through the brain in your stomach, and then continue above your brain, through your chest and into your empty skull. And then back down again. What does that do for me? I'm trying it right now. I'm like, I'm imagining my brain in my stomach. At least I'm full. That's the good news. You've got you to gotta try it a few times. If you okay. do that a few times, or you will massively feel less nervous, huh. less anxious. You will feel more prepared. And then there's, there's a couple of other things we could do to add to that as well, which are really great. One of them is a power pose. Mm. And uh, I think it's Amy Cuddy who first uh, I heard talk about these. You've got two main power poses. One is um, hands on hips, ready to take on the world. And the other one is hands above head, Superman style, that kind of thing. And what you can do is close your eyes again, choose one of those poses, whichever one you feel more comfortable with, and then think back. And then we talked about neurons earlier and how they remember emotions. So think back to a time in your life where you felt fantastic, where you felt confident, where you felt like you had just absolutely been the best version of yourself. This could have been getting a job promotion. It could have been winning a sporting event. It could have been a moment in your life graduating, uh, having a child. It could be a moment that you helped someone else and that just felt really good. But find that moment and feel those feelings as you remember it. Mm. And then pull it all together. I've said the one thing that helped me a lot over the years, um, that's really helped me not worry about that fear of being on the stage is, you know, those bubbles that like, I don't, I, that's how I explain it. Like the little nervous bubbles when it's just like those tinglys yeah. in your stomach, when you're about to get on, yeah. you're like, bah, you're ah, those are the worst. Uh -huh. so for a long time, I always had that feeling of like, oh, that's like trouble. That's bad news. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I just trained myself to think whenever I feel those bubbles, that's excitement. That's yep. fun. And I Absolutely. want to do this. I want to be on this stage. I want to be pitching this thing. And so just kept, I just kept telling myself that over and over and over. And now today when I feel those things, it's like adrenaline, like that feeling of those nerves, those bubbles it's just in my stomach. It's just like, oh yes, there they are. That's what I needed. That's what I wanted. Absolutely. Yeah. And then and again, that, it's like the made it so I don't, I'm not scared. Effects. Right. Exactly. It's exactly the same feelings. Mm. Uh, the other thing you can do is, is, is phrase how you pump yourself up. So if we say, I can do it, I can do it, then we're trying to convince ourselves. If we ask ourselves, can I do this? And we genuinely go, yes. Then we're not convincing ourselves. <laughs> it's like we already know the truth. We, we're confirming it because we know we can do it. Yeah, we might not want to do it. Yeah, we might be scared of it, but we can do it. And I think we all know that it's worth putting yourself through that pain and fear because of the results you get on the other side. There's a, another great book I read. Unfortunately, the author uh, is not with us anymore, but it's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Because that's the only way we progress in life. When have we ever done anything really brilliant in our lives that wasn't at least a little bit scary mm -hmm. and uncomfortable? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, this has been a lot of great, great advice. I hope anyone listening here is just pumped and ready to breathe through their stomach, through their brain and get out there, <laughs> listen to some classic speeches 
go through like their, you know, stories and figure out something like there's a lot of good skills here. I think of, of getting a better pitch and being more confident. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's been great. Next, I want to talk about creative leadership because we've talked all about skill building, but now let's talk about, so what does creative, creative leadership have anything to do with pitching? So mm. tell me about that. What do you, what are your thoughts on creative leadership and how it applies to the art of the pitch? I think it's got everything to do with pitching. I think that everything to do with it. It's why I can be running a big part of a sales organization in an IT company with a degree in fine art <laughs> because <laughs> because it's huge because um well there's there's a few different things first of all um from a creative aspect what we must do as leaders is ensure that we give our teams autonomy and time and space i find that when um a creative team works with a uh, less qualified creative leader then it's much more about deadlines and cracking a whip mm. and it's a false economy because what you'll get back is something where um there's been no passion or joy injected no creative license no nothing so as leaders we must accept that if we want great creative certainly in a pitch then we must also make sure that our creative team has the deadlines that they need the space that they need and the autonomy as well rather than being too prescriptive I, I i always insist that people go off and and they go wild and they diverge in their thinking as big as possible before we start to converge into a final brief i think that's really important uh, the other thing that's big uh, for me is 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 play mm. and um I read a book uh, <laughs> called Loon Shots by a, a guy called Safi Bachol, and he came up with this concept of loon shots, whereby um, if all we do is give people briefs to work on, then how will they ever accidentally discover something wonderful? And, and, and in the creative world, when we think back at uh, you know, Picasso and Damien Hirst and you know, any number of artists especially, they, and musicians as well, they come up with stuff because they're experimenting. So with my team, uh, every week, as much as possible, we have a, a, a small sub team of two or three people and they have one week to go away and play and experiment with a topic. Everyone else has to do their brief, their IBM work and hit the deadlines and do the pitches. These guys go and they set themselves a topic. So it might be we want to do something with augmented reality. Next year, it will hopefully be, we want to do something with the Vision Pro, because we'll all have one. <laughs> um, but it might be we want to do something with 3D animation or whatever it is, a topic of some description that you don't already, you're not already an expert in or that you've never pushed very hard. And for a week, you push it. And we do like a Google sprint, basically, a five-day sprint. Um, and at the end of it, we've learned loads of stuff. We've had fun. And actually, we've created some kind of little asset that goes in our Loon Shots repository. That means when we do have a, a pitch and uh, some big senior client partner says, I need the next greatest, biggest, wildest thing immediately, you go, right, well, let me open up my Pandora's box <laughs> of crazy little ideas we've been working on and see if any of those take your fancy. And um, we've used loads of them in pitches now. It's, it's really helped us to move away from a pitch being synonymous with a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, that's awesome. That's inspiring. I need to go back and try that with my team. Yeah, you should. We should talk about it more. Like, I'd love to hear about your experiments because the other thing we don't do enough of, I, I think, is, or maybe it's just me, but join up as a creative community in the world of experimentation and, and pushing and sharing failures as much as sharing you know here's my latest very shiny polished finished version of something yeah something that we do that i've done actually for like man it's been 15 years is just a creative workshop every friday or every other mm. friday depending on the team and just every team member is assigned a week throughout the year and they have to come present on any topic they want it could be yeah. on quilting. It could be on a side hustle that you have. It could be on your trip to wherever and what you learn from it. But 
that's been awesome of just inspiring the rest of the team. Maybe it's not that they have a, a, a project or something to, to actually work on in, in regards to it, but it, it helps your brain make those leaps to other things where you're like, okay, mm. I see those interesting patterns in quilting that may show up in a design later on, you know, that I'm working right. on, but <clears throat> I think that's super, super valuable. Yeah, but that that's also really valuable in terms of creating bonds within your oh, team. Oh, yeah, the community again, is huge. Yeah, I mean, coming back to a pitch, I've been in situations before where the pitch team are meeting each other for the first time, you know, as they walk into the pitch. Oof. And, you know, to you and I, that sounds bonkers. Mm. But it happens all the time, especially in business. It's like, well, I'm the expert in the technology and I'm the expert in the UX and I'm the expert in the business. And so we all know our parts and let's come together and, and knock them dead. But actually you come together and there's no Synergy. je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Yeah. There's no X factor. There's no chemistry, synergy, whatever you want to call it. It's not there. And mm. you, that, the client feels that too. The client thinks this is a dead meeting, yeah. regardless of how good the things you're saying are. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess it's not just it's bringing it back. It's not just the emotion you bring in the beginning of the story or the beginning of the pitch. It's that interconnected emotion that ex exudes from closeness or friendship or a, a shared understanding that is also there. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've been in a pitch where the people you're in the pitch with are like, some of your closest friends almost because you've been working with them mm -hmm. for months on end mm -hmm. and you've been you know eating takeaways at the office at 1 a.m in the morning with them it's like when you finally rock up in front of the client they feel that and they think boy this is a team mm. this isn't me buying services from a corporation it's a team and i want that team of people yeah that's true well, that's good there's i mean often it's the team that yeah so no, you're good I don't... I was going to say, it's, it's, the, it's the team that can distinguish a win from a, a loss as well. You know, often we're selling the same thing as our competitor in the IT world. Mm. So how is, how is a competitor going to choose? Well, if we are in a, a commodity situation where we're all trying to be the cheapest, they might go down that route. Uh, my company never is the cheapest, <laughs> so we have to do more than that. Um, and one of the things is you only get these people in the room in front of you if you choose us. Mm. And we've got to show you without a shadow of a doubt that these are the best people. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's a real selling point. That's awesome. Well, this has been fantastic. I know we're pretty much out of time here, Danny, and I appreciate you coming on the show. And this has just felt less like a show and more like just a good long conversation and back and forth <laughs> of, of just ideas and stories and, and good stuff. So thank you. Thank you for sharing all this with us. It's my absolute pleasure. I, I, sorry if I talk too much. I think you and I could talk for many hours. <laughs> well, we could, but I'm sure people don't want to hear for two or three hours. I think 45 minutes is probably <laughs> a good amount. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyhow, that. thank you, thank you. So l last thing, how can people follow you and keep up with your career? Talk to them about where they can see your podcast and anything else you've got going on. Yeah, so I do quite a bit on social media. Uh, you can find me as Pitch Guy on TikTok, Instagram, Danny Fontaine on LinkedIn. I post a lot of things there as well. And if you go to pitchguy.co.uk, that's a website dedicated to all of this stuff, including the podcast. Uh, or you can search for Pitch Masters on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, whatever you like, and you'll find all of the episodes ad-free for your delectation. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for listening. This has been an awesome session. I hope you're all pumped up and ready to go out there and tell some emotional stories. I know I am and get the team, get the team thinking about uh, random ways of, of pitching ideas. So thank you so much, Danny. As always, you can find me at adamwmorgan.com. And finally, this show is produced by the Stoke Group, a full service digital agency that specializes in content marketing, video and interactive experiences. So if you're looking for a partner for strategy or content or anything else, visit thestokegroup.com. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you on the next episode.